we must develop what the 20th century psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott called the capacity to be alone. When the fear of solitude makes us dependent on others, we become overly compliant out of a fear of abandonment, and thus build up what Winnicott called a false self, that is, our personality becomes a mere reflex of how we believe others want us to be. It is in developing the capacity to be alone that the false self can be broken down, thought Winnicott, rendering us able to rediscover our true self, or in other words, our authentic feelings and needs. In the modern day, most are oblivious to the benefits of solitude. Instead, many unknowingly adhere to what is called object relations theory, which is based on two key assumptions, that the maturation of one's personality can only be facilitated through interpersonal relationships, and that these relationships are the primary, if not sole, source of meaning in life. In his influential work Attachment and Loss, John Bowlby, an adherent of this view, wrote, Intimate attachments to other human beings are the hub around which a person's life revolves, not only when he is an infant or toddler or school child, but throughout his adolescence and his years of maturity as well, and on into old age. Taken to their extreme, the assumptions held by object relations theorists imply that the individual's life has no meaning apart from interpersonal relationships thus overlooking the well-established fact that meaning can be found and personal growth stimulated when we cultivate, in solitude, a relationship with some form of creative work that consumes our attention. As the 20th century psychiatrist Anthony Storr argued in his book Solitude, A Return to the Self, it is in the struggle to give form and order to an external creative work that we also, often without knowing it, are imposing form and order on our mind. Maturation and integration can take place within the isolated individual to a greater extent than I had allowed for. Introverted creators are able to define identity and achieve self-realization by self-reference, that is, by interacting with their work rather than by interacting with other people. It is this ability to achieve self-realization by developing a relationship with our work that led the Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky to claim solitude for the mind to be as essential as food is for the body. In solitude we can forge our character away from the often constricting external demands of others and maintain our independence in the relationships we do cultivate, thus ensuring we do not, like many today, lose our identity in them. Yet as we learn to flourish in solitude, we must not dismiss the dangers of it which Nietzsche spoke of, dangers which led Goethe to write, there is nothing more dangerous than solitude. We can increase our capacity to deal with these dangers, however, if we consider the possibility that the benefits of solitude are embedded in its dangers, meaning that it is only by voluntarily seeking out solitude and confronting the darkness within that we can extract the benefits of being alone, and perhaps even eventually attain the rare self-confidence of one who has gained sovereignty over himself. As the poet Rainer Maria Rilke wrote, You should not let yourself be confused in your solitude by the fact that there is something in you that wants to move out of it. We know little, but that we must trust in what is difficult is a certainty that will never abandon us. It is good to be solitary, for solitude is difficult. That something is difficult must be one more reason for us to do it.